warm up. Welcome to the foundation for the study of cycles market forecast 2024. I'll be roll calling a, a few of you attending live stream on YouTube now and in a few minutes as we actually go officially live. It'd be wonderful to hear from all of you. Where are you from around the world? Um, just type in uh, the YouTube chat, country, favorite market. And, and if you have a view on markets for this year, you can throw that in too. We'll be starting on the hour in a few minutes. So just warm up. And as we do, I'm just getting the uh, cities around the world. I see we have people from London, my, my home base, Geneva, Germany, Isle of Man. So good Europe and UK representation, USA, of course, New Jersey, Toronto. Nice global mix. And we have from the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Los Angeles, we're literally jumping around the globe now, <laughs> and Philadelphia. Welcome, everyone, a truly global audience, Slovakia, Chicago. Let us know which markets you're interested in, any potential views on the markets, risk on, risk off, S&P 500, new all-time highs in line with consensus or do we go sideways or and down any bears out there we have people from india ottawa and the list goes on feel free to throw in some market uh, preferences in terms of which ones you trade analyze apply cycles on and any views out there it's always good to pulse check with each of you and find out what the collective view might be. So we have some people interested in natural gas. There we go. Saudi markets in terms of more local, regional focus. And Ron, as long as you're doing a pulse check, I want you to know I still have a pulse. <laughs> That's always good too. <laughs> it works in many different ways, Jake. Thanks for that. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Uh, and and naturally, pressure. I can see here S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, uh, precious metals. So the traditional uh, cross asset mix. Okay, so we're a minute ahead of start up. Uh, so I'll I'll get ready for the formal welcome uh, to the foundation for the study of cycles market forecast twenty twenty four. I should say this is our fourth annual flagship event. It's great to to say that, that we've been running uh, as part of this new chapter for the foundation four years uh, stretch uh, today, January 9th, 2024. And th the big news in terms of registration is that once again, it's the highest ever record signups. Thank you for signing up and attending thousands of registrations, uh, which is always a great uh, demonstration of trend and momentum for the subject of cycles uh, on a global level, as we can see here in the chat, uh, there will be an exclusive uh, uh, elite speaker uh, insight uh, shared over the next three days, uh, six speakers in total, uh, uh, each day being two hours, full immersion of uh, cycle insights, looking at markets, uh, but with different cycle application, uh, and it'll be very exciting to, to share those views. And then, of course, keep those questions coming throughout uh, the session. As always, uh, we, we aim to maximize value. Um, and ahead of this event, we have been sharing uh, free uh, online bonus videos. Uh, that's available on Cycles TV. Uh, both uh, myself, Ron William, your host, uh, also presented uh, during that time, along with uh, FSC board member, colleague Andy Pancholi, uh, that's available on Cycles TV 
on the YouTube channel that many of you will already be uh, reviewing. And then just a flash review of what to expect today over the next few days. Uh, so we have uh, Larry Williams, our guest speaker, uh, who will be speaking very soon, followed by Lars von Thienen. So that's day one today. Next day, Jake Bernstein, followed by uh, another guest uh, keynote speaker, Robert Prechter. And then last but not least, day three, Jan 11th, uh, our FSC board member, Bill Sarubi, followed by one of our FSC uh, senior members who's part of the uh, advanced uh, group of cycle practitioners, Stan Harley, uh, who's a seasoned practitioner. And just as a quick reminder before our first speaker, Larry Williams, uh, please keep those questions coming uh, in the YouTube chat box. I will review it ahead of time just to make sure we have a good uh, uh, mix of questions for each of our speakers uh, once we get to that uh, moment. And I'd, I'd, at this point, I'd love to give the opportunity to Jake, Jake Bernstein, legendary trader, to introduce a, a, a well-known lifetime professional friend, Larry, uh, to us all here at the Foundation. Thank you very much, Jake. And thank you, Ron. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak briefly today. Uh, I am in the Santa Cruz Mountains of California right now. I do not have very good bandwidth. Otherwise, I would show my beautiful picture, but not today. I speak tomorrow. I did want to take this brief opportunity to say, number one, thank you for the Foundation's hard work. And you will find nowhere as many experienced years of trading knowledge as you will here today. And we do it all for free to further the cause of cycles. Just briefly, many people ask me how I got started trading in the summer of 1967. Let me say this. I always tell them that ultimately, after several years, I found the foundation for the study of cycles, and that interested me in my trading. But the reality of it is, I first found Larry Williams, who had been out there for a number of years before me. When I was exposed to Larry's work, which is based on patterns and cycles and seasonals, it changed my life. So I owe it all to you, Larry. I hope you have a great presentation. I know it's going to be fantastic. And I'm humbled by the amount of effort that you put into this work and all the great things that I've learned from you, Larry. So I'm going to give it back to you, Ron, or back to you, Larry, whichever you prefer. Uh, back to Larry, over to you. Okay, well, let's do it. Jake, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a real honor to be here and uh, especially to get those comments from Jake. Uh, Jake and I have been friends for well, more years than we can remember at our age, I think. Um, so it's uh, it's always flattering to think that somebody would even invite me to come talk about this stuff. So I appreciate it. I hope I can teach you a few things today uh, about the markets and about how I see the markets. So let's begin with that. We'll start with my PowerPoint, which is, I think, a really a, a huge important question. Can cycles help us see the future? I mean, we really have to get that answered. Uh, there's so much stuff about cycles out there that uh, doesn't work, hasn't worked, and we need to get some factual analysis about what does work with cycles. Uh, everything has limits in life, and I think some people take the potential for cycles way beyond uh, the reality of cycles. So I'm going to try to document some of this. Are we just kidding ourselves? We need proof. So I'm going to give you some proof, and then I'm going to show you how you can do this as well. This is a forecast we made in 2023, my natural cycle forecast, private formula, doesn't matter what it is. But you can see what the forecast was for all of 2023, a bull market, and a lot of strength at the end of the year. That was the forecast actually made in 2022, and this is how that came out. So there is evidence that we can get a view of the future. Is it a precise view of the future? No, not really. Can we call a market to the day? I don't think so. A lot of people claim that you can, but I don't think that's important. If I know, generally speaking, I want to look to be a buyer in this area or a seller in this area, I'm way ahead of the game. It's hey, Larry, kind of like- This is Richard, yeah. and we need, your, we need you to share your screen. Share screen. Oh, yeah, let's do <laughs> that. Is that better? It's coming beautiful. Thank you. Okay, we see it now. Okay, so we'll go back. That was the cycle forecast. And then this is what actually happened in the market itself. 
So uh, to me, cycles are largely a, a two things, a setup tool that says I want to be looking for sales at this time of the year, taking profits. I want to look for buyers over here, uh, an entry in the market. If I like the stock, I'll talk more about that. So it, it's it's a long-term version. One of my real thoughts in 2023 is to be successful, uh, you, you need to have perspective and patience. So how do you get perspective? Well, you read somebody who's very bullish or bearish. I mean, maybe it gives you perspective, but if they're wrong, you're really lost. I think cycles give you perspective of the overall trend of the market and when the best points to be a buyer or a seller are. Then that allows patience. That allows patience so you can persevere. You, you have perspective and, you know, the markets are tough, but how do you persevere well, uh, here's a good case. I started buying the S&P in here heavily. And, and um, I got losses here. I got losses over here. But I had perspective so I could persevere through this and I had a huge, huge run. You can only imagine because I, I really loaded up the market in here of what's happened on this rally. So cycles give us perspective that allows us to persevere. It gives us some patience in the market like, when to wait for this time. So I think that's how I use cycles in terms of, of using them as a trader or looking into the markets. Here's a little more proof of the markets. This is the forecast we did for 2023 for Nevada, one of course the big all-time stocks. And you can see this is the path we thought from July into the end of the year being 90% probability of a rally in the market. And these are when the significant lows and highs should come. Those are the buying opportunities in the market. That was made a year in advance, okay? How did it come out? Well, there's the lows. You can see what happened in the market. There's that rally that we saw that we would see from over here. So it, it, it is possible to generally predict what's going on. But am I going to predict the absolute hour? I think there's too much erratic activity in the market, too much irrational stuff, news, whatever happening, that I'm, I think I'm going to absolutely call the absolute high of the day of, of the low of the market. I'm more concerned about, oh, that's the path I want to look for, be a buyer in these areas. That's how I use this stuff. Here's a forecast for you for 2024. This is an actual forecast uh, we're making for Rockwell. So about January 8th, I would expect this market to come down until about the middle of May rally up to around the first part of August, pull back into the 10th of August, uh, 10th of October, and start to rally again. However, there's something called inversion in cycles. My good friend and Jake's good friend, Wells Wilder, uh, Jake traveled all over the world with Wells, and uh, I've met Wells and helped him actually help Wells get going in the business. Wells said cycles can invert. And I said, oh, that just means that the cycle was wrong. He said, no, he called it an inversion. If a top became a bottom, I said, you're dead wrong. He said, no, it's an inversion. And I've come to believe that Wells was really on to something. So it could be, let's say that Rockwell rallies all year long. Then if it rallies up in here, that May uh, 13th time period would be a peak in the market. So these dates are equally important and there should be a cycle reversal. Now, this is the important thing about cycles here. This is when the cycle should reverse. Maybe the cycle is going down. It doesn't matter if the cycle is going down or up. There's a reversal at these time periods. That's my expectation. Also, huge important thing. People think that cycles predict the magnitude of a price move. It looks like a big price rally, a big price drop. No. Why? Cycles measure time. They don't measure magnitude. Cycles are how many days, how many years, how many months. They're measuring time, and they might get the length of the time move from here to here, but the magnitude, the price scale, which we're where we get paid over here, is not a part of cycles. That's something else that we really haven't quite captured, and at least I haven't, in, in my meager cycle studies. So I know there's... Since we've been rallying, this should be a peak in the market. That should be a low in the market. But as we get into May, we'll look and see, are we in phase with the cycle? If so, then we're going to see a rally here. 
So that's how we can forecast out in advance. The red line is a longer term trend of the market. So we can get a kind of an intermediate term, that's the blue line, and then a red line, a longer term view of the market. And there could be a contradiction. They are always in agreement, but that's the markets. We don't have perfection in the markets. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but there's, there's an actual forecast you can see, and you can take that into the future. There's more to cycles than just stocks. So I think so many of focus on a 32 day cycle in the stock market or in Tesla or whatever. I wanna go beyond that. And I think there's a wealth of information for investors and stock traders if we, we get away from price for a little bit. I'm gonna show how we can use this cycles on other things. And here's why. Uh, I, I'm a graduate from the School of Journalism, University of Oregon. And uh, one of the very best classes I had was logic from Professor Albury Castell. I'll never forget that guy. And in my logic class, one of the first things I learned, because I didn't know about logic, I was a football player and art major. I didn't know about this educational stuff. He said, you cannot predict A with A. That made a lot of sense to me. But uh, as technicians, we've been trying to predict price with price since the first chart was developed. And it's, a, it's illogical. So we say, well, we're predicting the momentum of price, not just price. But I, I wanted to back away from that and try to predict A with B or C or D. I think that can be more effective. So I turned my cycle studies to things like inflation. And the black line you see is inflation, their CPI index. And this is a forecast I made in 2021, the end of 2021. And the cycle said inflation should start to go down. Now, if that's true, and if you know that, you're way ahead of the game. This is the way it came out. There's a CPI and there's a cycle inflation. It looks like around 2026, we'll start to pick up on inflation again. My big point here is we can use cycles to predict exogenous data to the stock market. So our stock market predictions will be better because they're based on something outside of just price. And they're based on things that actually really drive price. Inflation is hugely important to the stock market. I think we all know that, but how do we apply that? And I think we can apply that by using what we see here, cycles to help us give a sense of where we are within the structure of the fundamentals of the market. Here's another one. This is another forecast we did in 2022, at the end of 2022. The green line is money supply. And I found that GDP, which is black, can be predicted by money supply, the cycle of money supply. So the cycle of money supply is green. And as you can see, GDP follows that pretty well, which I thought at the end of 2022 meant GDP would pick up in 2023, which meant there would not be a recession. All the media mongrels forecasting the huge recession of 2023, uh, rich dad, poor dad guys said it would be the worst crash ever. Jimmy Rogers, the worst crash of his lifetime. The guy at Morgan Stanley, a 30, 40% decline in stock prices big recession we're going to enter. Well, well, hold on. If money supply predicts GDP and it looks like they kind of match each other, then we can see that that cycle of money supply says that GDP would go up in 2023 and there would not be a recession. And this is how it came out. That's what happened in 2023. GDP went up. So we knew it would go up here, or believe it would go up because of a cyclical study. So the study of cycles is just hugely important to go beyond just looking at a stock or a stock market index. It gives us a better understanding of the world that we live in. So here's my very long-term outlook on stock prices. I thought I'd share that with you. This is a report also made a couple of years ago Basically, we should rally up into a peak of somewhere at the end of 2025, 26, 85% probability of a rally. You can see a strong rally coming here, maybe the last bull market for a while. Then we start to go down into 2032. 
that scares me. I don't know what that's going to do, but that bothers me the most at this time in terms of long term. So I've been really bullish on the market the last couple, three years. Actually, since the pandemic low, we bought the week of the low. When uh, mad money saying buy the week of the low and again, the week of the low in 2022. Um, so I've been really bullish in the market, but I see I'm going to probably start to have to change that bullish. I'm not always bullish that we may be seeing something happening in 2026, like something we've seen before, and it won't be the rip roaring bull market we've seen. So this is the thing that worries me the most is still out there in the future. We need to get more data. We'll see what's happening with inflation, money supply, GDP, all those things once we get there. But looking at just price cycle, that's my worry point in the marketplace. I'm going to take a new look at the decennial pattern. You know, this is based on a 10-year pattern in here. That's a decennial pattern. And we're going to look at a new way of looking at the decennial pattern this year. i this is the first time it's been presented by anybody, by me, or I, I think it is an original idea no one has ever worked with before. And I thought I'd share it with the foundation. I hope you'll enjoy it. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, whether it's Dewey or Benner with the Benner's properties written a couple hundred years ago. Gann, who I certainly don't always agree with. I think a lot of Gann stuff, he had some horrible prediction, but he opened our minds to look at the market in a different way. Edgar Lawrence Smith, I'm going to talk about him in a moment. I mean, so many people in cycle, Jake Bernstein in cycle work. Uh, we're standing on a lot of other shoulders, and I'm just a guy standing on the shoulders. If you go back to the New York Times in 1931, they talked about a conference of economic and beyond economic analysis. And they said the most remarkable feature of the conference is a great amount of evidence as to a cycle of nine to 10 years. That was in 1931. Edgar Lawrence Smith had written a book called Tides and the Affairs of Men. I first read this book when I got involved in markets in 1962. I wish I would have paid more attention to it. Like it's a little thin book. Uh, it's, it's just a wealth of information. Now, Edgar Lawrence Smith is an interesting man. He was the one who ultimately wrote the paper that changed Wall Street. Prior to Edgar Lawrence Smith's work, everybody bought bonds and said bonds would outperform stocks. But Edgar Lawrence Smith's main paper said that stocks on a long-term basis would outperform bonds. Who grabbed onto that paper? A guy named Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett became an advocate of Edgar Lawrence Smith for that fundamental consideration. I have because of his cyclical work. His 1930 postulate was there appears to be a tendency towards decennial reoccurrence and major stock price movements. In other words, well, there's about a 10-year pattern in the marketplace. And I found that to be generally correct. It's something I look at every year. It's a generally good idea. Now, Newton's law, as we all know, says an object once in motion tends to stay in motion. And I think that has application to cycles especially the decennial pattern. If we look at the same year as Edgar Lawrence Smith did, all years ending in two, say 1902, 1912, 1922, they don't all match. Some are more in alignment with others, but usually all two years trade about the same. And I started thinking about that. Well, some years, these two years don't match the way all two years transpired. What happens when the following years, the market doesn't respond to the two-year pattern? And this is what I noticed. And my, my postulate is an object in motion stays on the same path. What do I mean by that? The years, the two years that match the current two-year the most, that pattern will probably continue the following year. In other words, that motion stays on the same path. I'm going to give you some examples of that now. Here was my original work. In 2008, I took all of the years ending in, ed, uh, in, in uh, 8, uh, 1908, 1928, 1938, 48, 58, 68, 78, got it all. Of, and on average, that's the way all years ending in, in 8 have traded. It was a horrible forecast for 2000. 
uh, and eight. It was totally wrong. Now, what's going on? What? So I started working on this in 2009, 2010, 2011, and I came up with this idea. What if I took all the years that best fit to 2007 and then for, saw what happened in the eight years after that? So I'm trying to be clear here. So I looked at the years that were the best fit to 2007 and then took just those eight years the next year and extended that out of time. And that's this path, which was a whole lot better. Was it perfect? No. Did, did get the first of the year rally, got the break, got the rally, got the huge sell off and the decline at the end of the year. So I thought, hey, I'm on to something here. I got something. This is really interesting. And I've been working with that since. And that's what I'll be talking about and explaining to you today. Here's an, another example. Um, we're looking at 2000, uh, all years that end in two in red. And in blue are the years that best fit. So then the question is, if this is all years in two. These are the years that bet fit. What happened the following year? And here's the following years in red. Well, it wasn't that good of a fit. But look how closely the best fit years were. In other words, these best fit years continued in the future. The next year is what you see in blue as a better pattern than just the red pattern. This was a much better pattern. So I think I'm on to something here that, you know, I don't have a background or training in math, so you're going to be a lot better at this than I am. Um, and you may be able to carry this farther than I've carried it, but I think I'm really on to something here. We'll continue with that. I took all the patterns in 2019, this is 2019, and all nine years are in red. So it will be uh, 1909, 1919, 1929, 39, 49, 59, 69. That red line is all years ending in nine. And the nine year was kind of close. It wasn't bad. And, but then the blue line is the, the years I forget what they were, let's say 1919, 1949, and 1979 were the years that were most like 2019. Got it? This is all nine years. These are the years that best fit 2019. So how did that carry forward into 2020? And here's what happened. The all years didn't do that well. And the best fit year did a really good job of predicting what would happen in 2023. So I think that there is this carryover effect. In other words, if you can find the years in the decennial pattern, not all years, but just in the decennial pattern, if you look at, say, uh, and we'll look in a moment, a forecast for 2024, if you look at all the three years, uh, 1903, 13, 23, 33, you'll get a pattern of how a three year should trade. If we then look at how the three year this year traded and find the years that traded the most like this three year, we can then extend that out into the next year to get a better forecast than the original decennial pattern that Edgar Lawrence Smith wrote about. I hope that's clear. Uh, this is the first time I've talked about it, first time I've tried to explain it. So I hope it's clear. So here we take uh, all nine years and there's the blue is the best fit. And I just have noticed this over and over again. We take the 2019 matched years, that's the best match, the blue line, versus all nine years. And then we carry into 2020, the best fit blue line called the crash, if you will, the rallies and the strong end year end rally, whereas all uh, 20 years didn't fit that nearly as well, carrying them forward. They called for a big rally when we didn't have it. So again, we see this idea of best fit may be the way to handle the decennial cycle. Going just a little bit further, the purple line now is all years ending in the zero. So this would be the decennial pattern itself. But if we took those from the best fit, we get a much better example of a forecast for the market.
Is it highly accurate? No. Do I have better ways of forecasting the market? Yes. But generally speaking, most people want a quick and dirty way of forecasting the market. Most people are aware of the decennial pattern. And I think this is the way to do it based on the assumption of cycles of repetitive action in the marketplace. Let's take a look at 2021 to forecast 2022. The red line is all years ending in one. And this is the black line, of course, is 2021. And it wasn't the perfect match. It called a rally at the first of the year, a rally here, but the best fit, those are the years that best fit 2021. There were some years that ended in a one in that decennial pattern that were a best fit to 2021. So how did that carry forward into 2022? As follows, the blue years got the high, whereas the red years said the high of the year would come over here, wrong. And they both were in pretty good sync rest of the time, but on balance, the blue line did better than the red line. In other words, those select years that were most like the last year predicted better than all years. Then uh, we can see all, all years in two are blue line and they did okay. But again, the prediction from the prior years did better. So uh, where are we right here right now, right? What's gonna happen in 2024? That's why you're here today. That's why you're watching, right? Um, uh, this would be the projection. If we take all years in all three years in red, that projects out like this. If we took the ones that best fit 2023, that projects like this, actually quite a bit of a difference. We see the best buy point would be August, the middle of October, and a strong year-end rally. So for those of you who have followed the decennial pattern, I know the Foundation of Cycles have a lot of work on the decennial pattern. Um, I think we have a new way of looking at it. If you pull out those years, that best fit the current year, then take those next 12 months forward, you get a better projection of what should happen. Perfect projection? No. Are there better projections? Yeah, I think so. I do that in my cycle forecast I do every year. But it's a pretty doggone good way of getting a quick and dirty projection of what's going to happen. And that projection says, a rally first of the year come down and we end up higher for the year. That will continue in a bull market. At the end of 2025, or 2024 rather, you see which markets best fit 2024, and then take those years to make a projection to 2025. I'd like to say it's just that simple. I hope that that's been simple enough uh, for you to understand. So if we use 2024 using all years ending in four, that's a light blue line. It, that would be the typical decennial pattern versus the one I just explained to you. So you can get a look at that. You'll probably want to take screenshots of this or rewatch it on YouTube or whatever. But I, I, this is experimental stuff. I mean, I don't have enough data to go way out of limb and say, this is the ultimate answer. And there's no ultimate answer anyway to this stuff. But it's a good way. We'll look back at the end of the year and see if, again, which worked out the best. The decennial pattern or my, if you will, new and improved way of uh, using the decennial pattern to help us get a glimpse of, of what could happen in the future. I want to talk a little bit about some things I've been seeing recently is less better. Uh, big data, using it's the hardest part. I think a lot of cycle people have made an error in their cycle studies. And I'd like to show that to you on the next few charts. Uh, I think this is a real important point to make. So watch carefully if you would. Here is the 18.6 year cycle in the Dow Jones Industrial Average as of 1966. And that said the market from 1966 should go crashing down to 1970. We actually had a large rally and then we did have a decline but just when we said we should have had a rally is when the decline happened. So that 18.6 year cycle, starting with all this is data out of sample, if we look at 18.6 years starting in 1966, it didn't do a very good job. 
if we come forward to 2008, it did an even worse job. If we start the 18.6 year cycle data from here backwards, we get that we should have been in a big, strong bull market and we weren't. Why is that? Especially when it looks like the 18.6 year cycle could be such a good cycle. Here's a blow up of that. There's the 18.6 year cycle with data back in this time period, no data forward. And we should have rallied, dipped, rallied. Well, we did that part of it, but cool. Wow, not a good call at all. Why? I think because of 1929. The data from 1929, 1930 is so strong, it permeates the data. So if we look at the S&P 500 that does not have 1929 in the data, we get a very different picture of 2008. We should have a big decline in the market and a big rally. Whoa, that was much more correct. We should rally up into the 2008, the middle of 2008 come down. Why is this different than this one? Because there's more data in this one. And this one includes a huge data outlier of 1929. I think you have to be careful about using data from 1929. Here's the 18.6 year cycle in the Dow Jones Industrial Average now using data from 1929 that suggests we rally and come down to a low in here. But we should have topped out way back here and been in a big bear market from 1921 to 1925. That's the hangover influence of data from 1929. If we look at the S&P, SANS data from 1929, we get a very different picture, don't we? We get a nice rally going into this time period. 2024 should be up most of the year, year-end rally. Whereas we see just the opposite. And this, which one's right? Well, we don't know for sure, because 2024 is not over. But I suspect that that hangover effect of 1929, which is still in this data, is just too all-encompassing, and this is the better view to follow than the Dow Jones average, that that data is so strong from 1929 that it has a bad influence in the data. The metonic cycle has been another one, kind of a lunar cycle a lot of people talked about. If we look at that, you really see the 1929 bias a whole lot more. Uh, right now, it looks like we're in a huge decline in the market. We should see Remember, this is using data from 1929. If we look at the S&P data, whoa, totally different ballgame here, isn't it? It actually says we should start to rally here. And it's done a much better job. It's not my favorite cycle, by the way. It's not even one that I use, but it's a popular one. A lot of people follow it. I think there's a lot better cycles to follow. But it's done a lot better job on the data without 1929 in it then it has, we should have been a buyer over here a little early, then it has in the S&P with data from 1929. So I'm going to kind of rest my case on that with that chart. I think that there is a big difference. And you've got to be careful of this, of using too much data. Uh, or at least if you're going to use, say, the decennial pattern and you're looking at all years ending in nine, you probably want to kick out 1929, because that data swing is so heavy in the data, it's going to uh, eat up all rest of data, and you'll just be looking at 1929. I, I, here's another good example. If you want to do a, an analysis of the commodity market index, uh, if you study it closely, you'll see that the CRB or the Goldman Sachs index is almost totally influenced by crude oil. If you take crude oil out of it, it's a totally different index. So one thing can balance, you overbalance whatever you're looking at. And my point here is you need to deal with that in some way. If you're using the Dow Jones Industrial Average stuff with the, the crash of 29 in it, or if you're looking at the CRB index or Goldman Sachs index, and crude oil is predominantly the major of the market. We have that right now, though. The FANG stocks, accounted what about 40 percent of the activity in the market last year so again you have to watch your data and understand what's in your data another good example of it if you go back and study the bond market jake will remember this 
in the 1980s or a big bond market rallies on Thursdays. And if you look at that data, you're going to get a really good trading system with Thursdays and then it falls apart. But who's there? What was, well, there used to be a, a government report that came out every Thursday and drove the bond market wild. Then they stopped doing it. Or back in uh, 1970, the stock market didn't trade on Wednesdays. There was so much volume, they closed the market down on Wednesdays, pre-computer, so I could handle the paperwork all done by hand. So Wednesdays didn't even exist in the 1970s. So you need to understand your data. And I think a big understanding of data in the S&P uh, comes from, you gotta be careful about using data that's heavily biased. You can wash that bias out, um, but you don't wanna use a lot of data without cleansing the data from 1929 uh, for the obvious reasons that you can see. Um, here's my true confession. I'm a recovering perfectionist. And that's a problem. You don't want to be a perfectionist as a commodity trader because there's nothing perfect about this business. The only perfect cycle is one examine after the fact. There are no perfect cycles other than that one. Uh, somebody, I just did my 2024 report and somebody said, how good is it? I said, it's a really good, it's a 2023 forecast report. And we perfectly forecast 2023 because you can do that. But the future, I'm going to vary a little bit. But I firmly believe that the markets are predestined to act in a certain way, which means I firmly believe the news of the day really doesn't mean very much. It'll cause an erratic fluctuation, but the market's going to go where it's going to go. Uh, and I think that's an important lesson that if you get in phase with that longer term trend of the market through cycles, uh, they're not worried about the short-term fluctuations of the marketplace. The things I know about cycles, I think weekly works best for forecasting. Again, I'm not a day trader, so I'm not interested in even there's too much erratic action, I think, for day trading. Very short-term, too erratic, is way too random. So I like to work on weekly data. And cycles are better at timing than magnitude. We talked about that earlier. Remember, cycles measure time, 32 days, 62 days, 435 years, whatever. They don't measure price movement this way. They measure primarily time. So they're not really good at magnitude. So the fact that we're high, low, high, low, that's just the way cycles operate. It doesn't mean you're going to have a huge rally. It means we should have a bullish influence from here to over here. But we'll show that with a line, of course, that goes up. They're not a be-all, end-all. I see them as a setup tool. Uh, and they are not good, at least in the stock market, at predicting tops. They might even be miserable at predicting tops in the marketplace. And here's why. It's a really important point. So many people have called the top in the market using a seven-year cycle and the market never topped, or a 10-year cycle, or an eight-year cycle, or whatever. Why? Because the stock market shows a strong upward drift, upward bias. It, it always goes up. So the tops we do get in the market don't last very long. The 2008 decline lasted, what, nine, 10 months? That was it. And the market went right back up again. So cycles, at least for the stock market indexes, don't call market tops very well. That's where I think we could bring in fundamental data that is a lot better job of calling market tops than trying to call market tops with cycles in the stock market is really hard. Now, commodities are different. Commodities are booth up, up, up. They go up and they go down. They're boom, bust, boom, bust. Because commodities go from um, oversupply to undersupply. So they're, they're very erratic. They don't have long-term drift. You look, the price of sugar goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down. We eat the same thing. Years ago, Jimmy Rogers had a commodity fund. He said, oh, commodity will go up in a great big commodity bull market. They did. They went up, down, up, down. When there's too much wheat, uh, prices come down. And if the wheat's too high, people will, or say cattle too high, they'll buy pork or chicken. And so then nobody has cattle and there's no cattle. And then cattle goes up because nobody had any cattle to produce cattle. Commodities are a boom bust market. They cycle differently than stocks. Gold, a boom bust market. Gold is driven by commercials. It's a commodity that's used, consumed, and produced. 
I love Sean Hannity. I love to listen to his radio show until they put on the gold commercial. Buy gold. It'll protect you from that. Gold's a commodity. It goes up and it goes down. I hate to spoil your dream about gold protecting you. It isn't going to protect you from anything. Oh, when we inflate, gold will go way up. Hmm. We inflated the last two years and gold went down. Well, how about in a major stock market crash like 2008 when gold went down? Or the panic of uh, 2020, gold went down. Or the crash of, you know, whenever markets crash, gold crashes too. So there's this whole emotional thing, which is an old wives' tale, that in a uh, recession, gold will go up, and now it goes down. In a stock market panic, gold will go up, and now it goes down. And I used to think in inflation, gold goes up because it did until about 10 years ago, we would inflate and gold wouldn't go up. I believe gold is a commercially driven market. So you want to look at the commitment trade report, look at cycles. There's some strong cycles in gold. You want to focus on that if you're going to focus on gold. Well, that ends it. If you're interested in my report of uh, forecasts for 2024, you can go to our website, iReadyTrade.com. I have been doing these uh, forecast reports now for 18 years. Uh, I'm still not perfect at it, but I'm not bad at it. So we do we have 30 or 40 stocks, all commodities, all major stock market indexes of the world. I do my cycle forecast on it. So you want to go into more depth, go to iReadyTrade.com, and you can see some free forecasts there and all sorts of stuff that would help you maybe understand what's going to happen in 2024. And uh, Ron, we probably have some questions that come in or Maybe I can put everybody to sleep. I don't know. And I am not hearing you, Ron. Ron, you're muted. Got it. I, I was just saying, everyone's wide awake and uh, have been pinging with uh, a, a great flow of questions. So I'm keen to follow up on, on the wonderful presentation with the questions. Uh, right at the top, Larry, if I can. Your market view, in, in a nutshell, whether it be market, economy, I find it quite interesting the point that you made about markets tend to drift up with that natural skew. Uh, and so sometimes looking at price, A plus A will still likely give you a variation of A. So looking at some of that fundamental data uh, with cycle uh, projections, what does that say to you for markets this well, year? Well, we're, we're in a bull market. Um... But yeah, so you want it, which means in 2024, you want to buy big market breaks and sell big market rallies. We're in a bull market. You don't believe the Cassandra's, the purveyors of pessimism will be proven wrong one more time. Now, another year or so, they're going to be right. They're right here, right now. Don't listen to these guys. We are in a bull market. Thank you. Uh, uh, follow up question on the decennial cycle. And the, uh, there's a uh, one on um, the best fit uh, framing that you, that you explained uh, from Richard, our FSC chairman. How do you decide if a past decennial year was a good fit with the most recent year? Well, the software that I use allowed me to do that. It'll it'll show which years were with the percentage the closest best fit. So I'm able to do that mathematically. Wonderful. And then a follow up question from myself, Larry. I, I've been a Big fan of uh, uh, cycles in general, your work, of course, along with uh, all other pioneers in this field and the work of Edward Dewey's, uh, of, of um, Edward Dewey, I was about to say Edward Dewey, but in this case, uh, Edgar Lawrence Smith has always been interesting to me, particularly his original book, uh, Tides and Affairs of Men. Um, there's a quote I have here from that book, and I just want to run it by you, Larry, in the sense that um, an interpretation of his uh, uh, cycle, his decennial cycle, was combining two periods. And that was uh, apparently the 10-year cycle was a mix of a 120-month cycle, um, uh, which would result in a 12-month uh, uh, pattern, uh, annual cycles with three 40-month cycles, and, and they would coincide every 10 years. It, it sounds a little bit intricate, and I'm just wondering um, how clear that was on, on the first read. Well, I, I think there's a lot of information in his book. Uh, and I today just went at the big, broader one he's most known for, the decennial pattern. But yeah, those other patterns, the yearly pattern, the 44, 45 presidential pattern, those are all interesting cycles you need to look at as well, for sure. He was okay. so far ahead of his time. 
And then just as a, a, a final point on, on uh, Lawrence's work, he's, he spent some time trying to work out why, uh, what that driver was. <laughs> Sorry to ask that rabbit hole question, but <laughs> do you find yourself asking why? And if so, what answers have you come up with? For a long time, I asked myself why these cycles happen. And some people say weather, some say uh, astrology, some say whatever. You know what? I decided just not to get in God's way. What's going to happen is going to happen. And I, I am certainly not nearly intelligent enough to have the answer to that. But I am relatively intelligent enough to be able to follow these cycles and take advantage of them and use them in my own life. But the broader, the big, broad question, uh, boy, I'm not the guy. <laughs> just, I'm, I just don't have any idea. I've got ideas, but, you know, I'm, uh, they're, they're meaningless. Focus on the effect, not the cause. <laughs> I, 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 I resonate with that truth. Uh, Bill's asking, do you have a, any correlation with seasonality? I know that's a big feature of your toolkit, Larry. Well, yeah, I think seasonality, here's the point. Seasonality is how the markets have traded on average in the past. So usually gold rallies in August. That doesn't mean it will rally in August this year, but on average, that's how it's rallied in the past. The cycles are more into how it's trading right here, right now, because it's taking the last three, two years, five years, whatever it is, whereas the seasonality is in the last 100 years or however many years you're studying. So I think the cycles are more like right here, right now uh, than the seasonality and the ideal thing when they coincide. They don't always. But if you have the patience and you have the perspective, because we can see in advance when seasonals and when cycles coincide, then you just have to be patient to wait for it. Like, you know, that's like shooting ducks in a barrel. And in terms of looking at cycles on, on um, non-price data, so we looked at economic data uh, just at the top. There's, there's some questions here about what about uh, sentiment data in terms of commitment of traders. Is that something that you've looked at and, and what's been the usefulness? Yeah, you know, like probably Jake can appreciate the most. I think Jake and I have looked at everything over the last 60, 62 years I've been doing it. So I can't remember some of this stuff. But the, the commitment of trade report, I don't know that it's, you can put cycles on it, but I'm just more concerned about what their, their position is right here, right now. Uh, if they get heavily long, the market's probably going to have a rally pretty soon. Um, I don't know that their action is all that cyclical. There's cycles to it, but I just use it more to see when they've been heavy buyers or heavy sellers. And then just to close, uh, Larry, uh, another market question, but different asset class. Uh, what are your top views on commodities? Well, they fluctuate. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm I'm long crude oil right now. So we're talking like right here, right now. I think a unique situation is in the soybean market and the grain market. Wheat has been stronger than soybeans. So my preference is the wheat. But what I notice about soybeans, we're not talking cycles now, is that the commercials are now net long. They have not been net long in this market for a long time. And when they do get net long, that's an abnormality, and in the past, it's been particularly bullish. So I've been stopped out once, uh, but I'm looking for some type of a move. So now you can bring cycles in to figure out when that move should happen. But uh, that's one market that really uh, stands out to me uh, immediately right now, and the crude oil market does, of course. Hold on, my phone rang. I apologize about that. My best friend calling me. We'll have to call him back a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> all good. Live is live. It's all part of the fun. Thank you so much, uh, Larry Williams. We've had a, a great flurry of, of uh, gratitude and thanks from everyone here at the Foundation Study of Cycles and the members that are tuning in live on YouTube. Uh, more questions uh, are still following and we'll be sure to follow up um, on email uh, to, to try and get those answers back to them. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, and thanks to the Foundation for doing what they do. To keep this study of cycles going, I mean, that's, that's great that w what Richards have done to, to reignite this and get it going again, because clearly we can get a glimpse of the future. God doesn't, doesn't let us see all of the future, but we can get a little glimpse of the future 
And if we do that, we're ahead of the next guy, which means we can be a better investor, a better trader. And the, the only way I know, the only way to get a glimpse of the future is with cycles. Thank you so much for those uh, words of guidance, inspiration uh, that many of us can follow. Um, and that will encourage I, I, that, that the, the, the future path of, of cycles and, and the FSC. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks again. Good luck and good trading to everybody. And a, a brief segue uh, before our next uh, speaker, uh, just to bring you up to speed with uh, the FSC, um, our membership benefits, but also what to look forward to in the new year of 2024. Uh, membership has uh, its privileges for the low yearly price of $150. Uh, that is the uh, special price here and now, uh, only available until Feb uh, 2024. Uh, remember that FSC is a nonprofit. Our work, including this event, is made possible by membership dues and donations. Please consider joining the FSC now, like many have uh, over the last few years. Um, there is a link in the chat just in a moment. Um, of our newly updated membership information um, and for special pricing uh, during uh, this week's events. So just watch out for that link in the chat uh, so you can learn more about the current membership, join now, uh, but also the multi-tier to come with a lot more uh, membership uh, value. Now, on that point, coming into the new year of 2024, I'm really excited to roll through with these uh, key uh, initiatives. Cycles Education Project. I'm uh, managing that myself uh, and looking forward to share more uh, in the next few months on that. Uh, we'll have an access level uh, foundation uh, education, uh, which will then uh, build out over time, but certainly a great way to learn, uh, get certified, um, and also uh, be part of a, an expert community around the world. Uh, annual Summer Financial Summit. When I first heard about this, I, I jumped for, for joy. As much as we love virtual sessions, we will get the opportunity to meet in person. So you can see Lars there on the screen and myself and various other guest speakers. We, we are real people <laughs> and you can actually talk to us in person. Um, have, have a fun chat, talk about cycles, like-minded uh, professional uh, insight sharing. Uh, that will happen uh, later on this year. So we're busy uh, working on that. Uh, more roundtables and other virtual events. Of course, that is good also uh, to keep the uh, activity of uh, uh, ideas uh, and, and, and views that everyone has. Um, also, for those of you that might uh, want to do that virtually or in person. Uh, first, live in person, I, I just covered there, as we have virtual and uh, live uh, to, to come. Um, and then the big grand finale is uh, for this year is gonna be the release of Dewey's book, March of 2024. And just um, on that point, uh, last, uh, last few words to share, uh, there's a donation uh, initiative, uh, donate $300 or more and receive a special advanced copy of Dewey's a book numbered at and signed by FSC Chairman uh, of the Board, Dr. Richard Smith. Uh, collectors have been paying $1,000 uh, and more for the first edition of this book. Uh, link in the chat if you want more information about how to donate to the foundation um, and also uh, for this book. Uh, this is to celebrate the historical republishing of Dewey's book by Harriman House. You can see the front page cover there, exclusive for everyone to, to see ahead of time the world's most prestigious financial book publisher. Uh, so that's the, the transition uh, infomercial in terms of uh, who we are, um, benefits to becoming a member, uh, but then also what to look out for uh, in the year of 2024. Um, and our, now our next speaker, FSC uh, board member, Lars von Thienen, founder and CEO of a knowledge uh, management company. Von Thienen develops algorithms and software for cycles recognition. He's published two books on cycles analysis and invented a standalone desktop search and knowledge uh, management app. Watch Von Thien and most importantly on Market Cycles Report every Monday at noon ET. Uh, a, a star 
uh, on that channel that, that you can watch on a regular basis, but also, as I learned some time ago, interact. You've got live questions you can actually ask in the session, which makes it even more uh, impactful. Uh, and as I just mentioned, a board of directors and, and a good team colleague. Lars, good to have you back. Um, and I saw Hi, Ron. Nice to be here. Yeah, sure. I mean, a financial summit without a, a session on crypto is not a financial summit, isn't it? So... Absolutely. And and actually, I, as I was getting questions on on the chat, uh, uh, just for our previous uh, guest speaker, Larry Williams, crypto did feature. So I'm glad that you'll be actually dedicating time yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, sure. We, we, we need to update. I mean, that's, I think, the third time now I'm speaking on, on crypto. And once you've found a pattern, I mean... Let's follow it. So that's the purpose of today's session. So let's see how it worked out and let's see what it means. Um, yeah. Um, can we know the future before it happens based on that pattern for the year to come? So um, that's why I want to, to look into it. But, but what an honor, I need to say that upfront first, what an honor to be in line, in the lineup of speakers with Larry Williams. So uh, it's kind of, uh, he's a rock star in that area. So um, I'm just a little guy, if you compare that. So it's really an honor to to have that slot, yeah. Standing on the shoulder of giants, as, as he uh, said yeah. earlier on. <laughs> feeling like that. Yes, it's feeling like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, over to you. Over to you, yeah. Lars. Ron, thank you. Yeah, um, as introduced, um, I will take the next hour around to have a look at cycles within crypto and in specific um, Bitcoin for sure. And let me start to share. Um, what to expect. So just let me know that audio and screen sharing is working somehow. Um, all, all good, Lars. Thank you for checking in on that. All good. So let me continue. Yeah, what, what you see here already in the title. Um, I want to talk. So the title is also around seasons. Um, and I gave it the title because once you know when seasons start and seasons end, that's already an important cycle in a lot of things. Um, but the seasons related to crypto do not refer to the classical seasons we might have in mind, like winter, spring, and summer. Um, but maybe there are also seasons um, which relate to cyclic behavior in Bitcoin. And that's the key point. So not only looking at one specific cycle, there's also a pattern which is related on some cyclic dependencies. And we talked about that. Maybe someone is uh, already um, in, in the group who has joined the session we did a year ago, um, where I featured the title, Has the Winter Ended? So this is the beginning of 2023. We had this huge rundown from, I think, 60K, 60, 70K to back to 17K. So um, it was a hard time for crypto and Bitcoin, and we talked about um, is the winter ending. Um, and now we need to check the question, how long might the upswing, which seems to have started since then, last? That's where seasons, cycles uh, can help us. So um, a year ago, we talked about has the winter ended. Today, we will talk about how long might the upswing last. And um, let me drive you through the uh, oh, two quick uh, topics. Okay, for sure. I mean, we need to take this into account. We are doing study of cycles. Um, this is for education, for sure. Everything can be wrong. You're on your own taking decisions, whatever, out of that. Um, this needs to be said upfront. Now, why Bitcoin? And I spend a lot of time in the research on cycles within Bitcoin. Um, and I covered this in a previous session, so I will not repeat everything here. But the interesting part, if you have a look at Bitcoin, is that we have a lot of parabolic moves seen in that asset class. If you go back to the year of 2011, yeah, where Bitcoin even traded below one US dollar, 
yeah, they have been these times. Um, and you see in the chart then the move up to 28 US dollar. This was a parabolic move. So if you compare these five uh, charts here, they quite look similar yeah, with complete different price offset points. But all these five charts are parabolic moves in Bitcoin. And what we're all looking for, we want to be on the left side before this parabolic move starts because it's crucial if you have these parabolic moves in whatever uh, a market if you are on the wrong side of that move um, it will always come down a lot and you see here after that parabolic move in 2011 bitcoin came down by over 90 percent 2013 over 70 percent 2014 again 90 percent 2017 83 percent 2021 that's where the um the the in sample period ends about what we are talking about today is we had the up move into 60k and that motivated me at that point in time to research is there a recurring pattern is there a season is there a cycle which can help us in detecting ah is this the end of a parabolic move yes or no um so that's why in the financial area there you can tell two stories of these kind of movements you can t tell stories about people who might become rich because they have just been at the right time on the left side of that parabolic moves and there will be maybe the same amount of stories which might have lost a fortune because they have just started uh, the fear of uh, um, FOMO topic yeah at the top of that point and then this asset class came down 70 80 90 percent this just did not happen once it happened five times now in bitcoin so for us now moving forward it's it's very important to get a timing wise information we are not here to predict the next price target of bitcoin is it 200k 400k whatever that's not the purpose why we are here or where cycles can help us but the timing and here it doesn't matter where the price is moving we need to ensure from a timing perspective that we are on the right side yeah, to the left or to the right of that parabolic move if we are it doesn't matter how high or high low it will go we just need to be on the right side in regards to timing so that's why it was so interesting to analyze all these individual parabolic moves as shown here. So the work where you will only see now a small, small amount um, in today's session um, is based on the research of every parabolic move since the inception of Bitcoin. So going at, at least where we have price data in 2010, 2009, something like that. And I did not analyze and to follow with uh, Larry's introduction with the static analysis of all historical data in one line. I, I went through each parabolic move step by step and just analyzed what happened before that move you know, to, to not put too, too much data into the analysis. So just looking at each individual parabolic move, has there been a cyclic behavior which um, could be a kind of uh, pattern at that given point in time. And um, as always with the analysis of cycles, you don't know what the outcome is. And often you don't find cycles or contradicting cycles, then you could not rely on that. But for that time, there have been some interesting outcomes. And um, for sure, in 20 minutes or so, you will see the um, path for 2024, what this means now looking forward. That's why we are here. Um, but in addition, I think it's very interesting to follow the basic principle and the idea, which also shows that it's not only just one cycle, there's often more in that cycle. So first, by analyzing all these individual parabolic moves, it has become clear that, is, that there is a 200-day nominal cycle in Bitcoin, which is always there, visible before the parabolic up move um, comes to an end. So not after the fact, before the fact of each parabolic up move, you could see and detect the 200 day nominal cycle. The pattern, I will come to that in, 
uh, in a second mo moment because these patterns of five and three these are the seasons yeah maybe keep that in mind if i start to talk about the pattern of count of five or count of three this is what i refer to the idea that's the kind of season yeah like a summer period how long it lasts for bitcoin yeah when you have a nice sunny uh, um, period or climate so that's the the count of five that's the, the summer the summer season for bitcoin and then we have the count of three which is more or less compared to the winter season so where it's cold and it's, it's hard it's tough so um, that's why i compare these two kind of seasons which seem to repeat and give you a kind of clue in what what season you are in today. So, and these seasons refer to the left side or to the right side of this parabolic moves. Um, just for reference, if you're interested in a long, deep dive into that, the session where I outlined all the research is available also on YouTube here on our FSC channel. Uh, it was the financial summit in the year of 2021. The link here is seen on that chart. You can pause here, use that link, find that. There's over one hour just explaining what I will now compress into, into five minutes here. It's just for reference. It's published 2021. Um, and as Larry mentioned, we now have some proof uh, after the fact, which gives us confidence. So why 200 days? Um, as I said, each parabolic move um, has been analyzed based on dynamic cycles or what we use here is mathematical digital signal processing, Fourier derivatives of digital signal processing we can apply to price data sets. You see in the, in the lower right is the spectrum based on the blue price uh, line you see in the, in the upper left which is the Bitcoin chart in the year of 2012, 2013. You see a peak here in the um, and the spectrum plot around 200 something so here it's 230 days so that's the peak uh, we have seen in the early days of 2013 and the cycle related to this 230 days is been projecting an upswing into april may of that year and that's the outcome so the light blue is here just after the fact so the, which was data which was not seen by the cycle analyzer. So the predicted top in May exactly was the final parabolic up move uh, from around 25 to over 200. Yeah? So this was the final upswing which the 200 day cycle um, has seen. And there's no special interpretation. There's one peak in that spectrum here. So let's now quickly move through these kind of charts here. We can move um, then also forward into quickly followed up in the year of 2014 yeah, or mid 2013. You see again in the spectrum, a clear peak around 200, projection of a possible peak at the end of 2013. That's the outcome. So the, the next yeah, parabolic upswing from around 200 up now to 1200. Yeah. You see the light blue is out of sample lined with the 220 days dominant cycle here in that case. And we can quickly browse through, move forward in time. This is the year of 2017 with live data. Again, you see the spectrum here in that case, 180 days. Yeah, so that's why I call there's a nominal cycle of 200 days. The real cycle for sure varies between 180, 230. So that's also the difference. If you call it a nominal cycle, it gives you just a classification, 200 days, and then at, at any given point in time, you need to check what's the phase and what's the current length of that cycle here. That's why the cycle analyzer is so important um, at each point in time. So here we have um, price was coming down in the year of 2017 and then projecting the key top at the end of 2017. And here this is what is what happened after the fact. So with the light blue, we have seen the parabolic move into the end of 2017 based on the 180 day cycle, cycle seen in advance by the cycle scanner. So the cycle was always there in advance. Yeah, and that was then the, uh, the situation we have um, discussed here in the year of uh, 2022 also with another cycle at the end of yeah, 2020 
Yeah, we have traded around 11,000 for Bitcoin. Um, and the upswing was projected with here with a length of 193 days into early 2021. And this is what happened. We moved from 11K to 60K just within that final upswing lag of this 193 day cycle. So it seems to be a 200 day cycle, which was always present there before this final up move in, in Bitcoin happened at each parabolic move. So yes, there is something around this nominal 200 day cycle. I mean, you know that Hearst and a lot of other um, early uh, cycle um, experts also use nominal models on different asset classes. So this is just the same idea of finding very important nominal cycles in that asset class. So the 200 day cycle is clearly one dominant nominal cycle for this asset class crypto we're talking about here. Um, but that's more or less very simplistic and it already helps us. If we know that there's a 200 day cycle, we can see where we are in that cycle. But you never know Will this be now the final leg of the 200 day cycle? You've seen that this cycle repeats and it has a lot of tops and a lot of bottoms. So you never really know, will this now be the final top or huh, the, the end of the parabolic move? So this is what the 200 day cycle, just as a nominal cycle, will not tell you by just looking at this cycle alone. So therefore, and it was, by the way, I did not expect this finding in, in analyzing these parabolic moves. And this is always why I repeat this analysis, because if you dig into the asset class and specific cycles for that asset class, sometimes you find something which is not obvious upfront or which you have not looked for as you started your cycle analysis. And this is what happened in that um, specific analysis here. Um, there is a clear count which helps us to identify which of these 200 day cycle swings will now be the final up move and which of these 200 days swings will then be the final bottom in the end. Um, and as I said, it, it was not expected to see something like that. But let me walk you through and this refers to the two seasons um, I'm referring to. There is one season before the parabolic up move, let's call it summer period. And there's one season after the final top appeared in this parabolic move. Let's call it the winter season. And it looks like that these seasons have a defined length, which can be measured in counts of these 200 day cycle. And that's now something really interesting, uh, which I revealed or shared with you also the first time in the year of 2021. And we now have some years after the fact to revisit if this idea also worked after the fact. Um, and that's what makes it even more interesting today because it looked like it worked out really interesting. But let me walk you through this, this count or the seasons here. So maybe not the most beautiful charts here, but they should outline uh, the story here. We start again in the year of 2011, so 2010, as we have the first data Bitcoin trading at some sense here. Um, I think there was even not really, we have not been able to trade Bitcoin like we are today, but uh, from the cyclic perspective, the cycles have been there already. So you, th you see now with the green marked numbers or labels on that chart, the count of um, the repetition of the 200 day cycle. And at that point it was a 220 day cycle. And you see, I've, I've started the count here with the first one, two, three, four, five. It appeared that at the fifth peak of that cycle, it is the end of the parabolic upswing here at around 800. So, and you see then on, on the right, it's that just the continuation on the time axis here. So the, um, the point in 2014, yeah, you can see it. It's the point of five where the final top occurs. And then I reverse the count to the bottom, just counting then the lows after that point. And you can count one, two, three, also forward until the low seems to be in place. I mean, this is one, just one case. Yeah, it's, it's not a pattern. I'm just looking at one case, but you can now check, okay, is this the same what happened as all these five uh, parabolic moves we've seen? So let's move forward and see if this count maybe 
repeats. So after the 1.3 account, so that's the, the winter season, yeah, ends at that price level, we reverse and start to count the one, two, three, four, five. So then the summer begins. Yeah, after the three, um, that's exactly here and then 2016, where the cycle just continues, it has changed to 200, uh, 180 days. So we are aware to measure the breathing or the variation of the nominal 200 day cycle. Um, and then we just count the summer season, which always seems to sum up of five repetitions of the nominal 200 day cycle. Once we arrive at the count of five, yeah, the summer ends, or it seems like that the final peak, so the last upswing of that final peak, is then the end of the next parabolic up move here in Bitcoin, which means at the count of five, the summer period ends, the winter period starts, and we would expect after the count of five, another down move, which lasts possibly three counts if we count the lows. So in 2018 here, we have arrived at the final top of that upswing at 16k for Bitcoin. And if we move forward in time on the left side, now you see the, 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 the summer period, which ended uh, in the year of 2018. And then I, then I switched the count again. After that point in time, we use the same 200 days nominal cycle. We just count the bottoms now, one, two, three. And after three repetitions have been completed, that's then the point where the winter season ends. We can switch back to the summer period and start again, one, two, three, five again. So, um, and if we do this procedure, um, this is what we see here. So 2019, if this would be again a repetition, then this needs to be a low point here around 35K in Bitcoin. Um, and then the next upswing should start into uh, to, cut, to kick in, which is then just on the right side of, of that page. You see then switching after the final leg of the three, we, sh we switch the count to counting the summer period which is then just the repetition five, one, two, three, four, five. So this would then be the expected end of the upswing. So the end of the summer season for Bitcoin. And by that point in time, five was the out of sample point. So because the, all this analysis was done early 2021, and again, the reference videos out there, I shared everything here in, in the FSC with the community. So this was interesting now to get proof if this seasonal behavior of the nominal 200 day cycle can help us to detect if we are on the left side of that parabolic or on the right side. I think this is an immense benefit, not just trading little swings, but if we know on which perspective. Yeah? I think Larry used the word, we need to have a perspective. Uh, if this seasonality in Bitcoin helps us to have perspective, if we are before the upswing or already in the downswing, um, this is uh, priceless uh, and, and we don't need to be aware of any price targets if we are that. So it has to be proven that this is truth um, or if this would work, then we needed to see the final top in Bitcoin in yeah, summer 2021. So after publishing this analysis, because we had the discussion yeah, after that Bitcoin came down from 70K, uh, okay, will, will it now continue to go down? Um, and after that analysis, I told you here, that we need to see a final upswing into September before the next winter period, so downswing starts. And if we talk about winter, Bitcoin always corrected around 70 to 80% after the 0.5. So we are not talking about small swings here. We are talking about an immense upswing and then a loss of 70 to 80% in that asset class during the winter period. So these are immense moves here. Um, so everything now, which happened after that point in time is out of sample for this analysis. And we have now the proof and let me walk you through the proof what happened afterwards. So the summary is, and watch the reference video for more details on each of these parabolic move. Um, the expected top for the final up lag in Bitcoin could be projected by the fifth repetition of the nominal 200 day cycle. And it's always seen three to six months ahead of time the cycle analyzer. 
You know, the 200 day cycle is just a nominal cycle. It could be something between 180 to 220 days, which you need to measure at any given point in time. After this count to five, count to five sounds too mathematical. So therefore let's call it after the summer period. When summer ends, after count five, Bitcoin always lost 70 to 90%. I mean, we are not here to do price protections, but we need to know that summer and winter are very heavy and different periods for the price action. So after that point in time, the expected low, so the end of the winter period, was always aligned with the third repetition of this nominal 200 day cycle, which if you measure that by time is always between one year and three months, between one year and six months after the top came in, you could expect the bottom or the winter period, the winter season to end. So that was the finding at that point in time. That was why this video ended also with, we would expect another um, up move into count of five. And then, and, and that's not just another up move, then this upswing is completed, game over, 70% down move afterwards. You will lose everything if, you know, if you're not getting out at that point in time, or if you invest now in this final upswing and you stay in, you will lose 70 to 80%. So it's not about just projecting another up move or down move here. Um, I, I summarized everything already, so you don't need that slide here. So now let's look what happened afterwards, and then I will switch over to what this means for this year. So that was the projection at that given point in time. Now just looking at the price chart. At the bottom, you see the nominal 200-day cycle, just visualized by these um, um, little um, um, cyclic um, uh, a chart here, and this was our summit. So I meant we need to see a final top around summer, which is in alignment with this cycle here in the future. This is what happened. And not only happened that we have seen the final peak, which was higher at the given point and, and four here. Afterwards, the winter kicked in as before and Bitcoin dropped around 80%. So that's, again, the parabolic move. You need to be careful if, if you have invested at this final up leg here um, and you have not been aware of that, you have lost everything afterwards anyhow. So um, yeah, the five worked. The pattern of five, the summer period worked again. So now the next proof was to be discussed one year ago. No, in January, 2023, we have met here again. We have discussed Bitcoin. I repeated that cycle. So if something works, it just works. We don't need to find other cycles. If stuff works, it just works. So, um, and it, it even, more validates the power of cycles once you have found working patterns stick to that um, so at that point in time where this the winter period now when does the winter end so at the january 2023 i mean the whole cryptocurrency had this headache and was worried about okay bitcoin is over game over um it will never go up again and, and the question the one million dollar question we called it at that point in time was when will the crypto winter end um yeah and we just had to look at our seasonal cycles in the asset class which have been there so there's proof that it was there we we, we never know it will if it will repeat again but we have some analysis which could help us on that um, um decision making so and as said, we are not here to do price project predictions. It's about when does the next parabolic move maybe start? When does it end? How long might it last? And then we have perspective. That's that's not final timing. That's not how where you can derive your trade entry and trade exit. And I'm sure Jake will tell us more during the next days how to build this up into a complete trading this this is just a perspective this is just a winner of opportunity um so and yeah january 2023 um this video is also there in in the public cyclic archive now um so it's it's always there for your review um i went out and told you change is coming and this was the chart i showed you here and maybe if you know um, have in mind what I told you before, this cycle is much more important than just looking at this single cycle. This is the 200 day cycle at that point in time, 213 days. But what, what was more important of that chart here, 
please count the lows um, starting in the year of 2021. So the early low is the start of the winter season. So this was number one. Count number one was January 2021, the low. The second low was then of that cycle somewhere, I think, September 2022, count number two. So now count number three was exactly May 2023. That's why I had a lot of confidence based on that cyclic analysis that this winter, this downswing, which was already 70, we have moved down from 70K down to, yeah, you see it here, 17K. So we have come down 80% again. Um, and I went out in January. Now it's the best time between now, January until May, yeah, to build up your long position into the next upswing. Because again, if this pattern repeats, this would have been the point in time. So the, the final downswing of this cycle here until May will then conclude into the end of the winter for Bitcoin. And this will be the start of the next summer period, which lasts then another five repetitions of the 200 day cycle. Um, yeah, just look on the chart here. I mean, today we know what happened afterwards. Bitcoin has moved up over 150% just by that call. And by the way, everyone is talking about the Magnificent Seven. Uh, this forecast was even better than that. So I think the, uh, the Magnificent Seven have driven the S&P 70%. Um, or have made a profit of 70% in the year of 2023. This was 100, but this is just the start. I mean, if, again, if this summer period now repeats as before, I do not know it. Uh, I will not make a, a, any call on that, but this is cycle analysis. So it worked out again, and that's what I said. We now have proof for a cycle analysis where a lot of research has been done. So. Again, refer to that video. Every parabolic move since the inception of Bitcoin has been analyzed and reveals that pattern. The final top, the final bottom is now proof that it was a perfect timing mechanism yeah, to identify first the top, second, that's now a good time to get into that asset class again between January and May this year. So that's it. That's why I said we don't need to change our wheels here. If we have a cycle analysis, which seems to have solid fundamental analysis based on, and this analysis also proved to be on point out of sample. So let's try to follow that analysis. A again, as said, this is not an perfect entry and exit mechanism. That's why we need to now revert the exact situation today. So. Coming back to the initial question, and again, that's why you, you are also here, not, not just learn something. I think that that pattern per se is interesting. I hope it inspired you already why cycle analysis as a subject, as a science, is very fascinating and can, like Larry mentioned, can give you a lot of perspective in a lot of different asset class, what's happening here, if you are willing to spend the time um, and that's why I, I need to make that call because it's easy to turn on whatever application tool set. And there are other tools. So Fourier is, is, is no secret source. Fourier analysis, digital signal processing, that's common sense how this is applied. Yeah? So detect cycles by just digital signal processing. Everyone can do this. You can do it, we can do it, we can do it together. So seeing a cycle somewhere is so easy in today's world. We need now to understand the, the way how we validate which cycle could be followed and which cycle maybe should not be followed. And, and that's why I always repeat the, the way how I came to that conclusion. And you, you will be honored once you, find, once you spend this time. Once, I mean, I invested a lot of time in that research for myself. Not, this study was free. Yeah? I invested that time because I'm a cycle analyst. I base my work on what I'm doing. So, uh, and, and the outcome, I can share it here with you. I have no problem with that. Um, and you will really be 
honored if you are willing to invest the time to see what cycles worked in the past, which cycles do not work in the past. And also Larry mentioned that commodities are different than stocks, stocks are different than crypto. So that's not only one cycle. There's not turning on the analyzer, looking at a sine wave line on a chart and thinking, ah, price will go up or down. So there's much more behind the scenes if you spend some time with it. And I was not looking for seasons as I started that analysis, but I was really honored. It was a gift and it worked out. So enough talk, sorry for getting a little bit emotional here, but cyclic analysis deserves time, needs time. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's not fair for cycle analysis. Okay, yeah, <laughs> today, <laughs> this is how it looks like today. So you have waited. Uh, a long time to get to this chart here. Uh, maybe at the first time it's not really easy to follow and I can switch to a live analysis in a second if you want. Um, I've just just setting the, the reference point here. So the line you see in, in May 2021, everything to the left is in sample. So everything on the right on that chart here is out of sample after the fact based on that count. You see the five and we discussed the one, two, three the low here early 2023 and now the up move here and I have now done some things here first <laughs> to, if you analyze the data based on today's data yeah so we now analyze on January 2024 Bitcoin price data where we are and what the most dominant cycle which will so, show up in the scanner I can show you this in a second is exactly 200 days. So what a surprise. But also good to see that it's, it seems like this cycle is still dominant, prominent, there again. It's not really changed. It's even more up to the point of 200. So the, the overlay you see here is adjusted to the current length of the current cyclic movement. So as we all know, if we deal with dynamic cycles, they vary over time and vary over time means the length yeah so the distance between top to top or low to low will always slightly change we we, are, we don't see these perfect static cycles in real life um, but we can measure where we are so if it's 200 so today it's 200 days at um, that given time here and we need to switch the count now to the summer season yeah so we we ended at the at the projected uh low of that downswing here uh which ended early 2023 or latest then until april may so you see it has slightly shifted so this has slightly shortened based on the 220 day cycle and we are now at count number two the the, the topping count for the second repetition of this upswing here so and this gives us two key messages at today's situation first it seems like the summer period has just started yeah so if this seasonality summer winter count of five count of three repeats again uh, this is just the early summer so we are just seeing the sun uh, shining but summer just started so it will last until and there even the, the chart is not enough into uh, summer 2025 yeah so this timing indication would give us uh, just started summer which should last into summer 2025 so the next one and a half years should be very bright sunny for bitcoin Will it be just a linear upswing? No, for sure not. If you analyze or review how the past counts of five worked out, and you can see it here on the left chart uh, between 2019 up to 2021, uh, that the count one of two, so two was even lower than one, and then it went up. So, and, and Larry mentioned this also, um, we measure with cycles, the timing of important tops and bottoms in the market. Does it always need to continuously move further upwards? No, we don't know. But there is this cyclic behavior. And on the way from one to five, we should see in general, maybe again, a parabolic move. 
But yes, from two to three, we can see uh, different swings in that. But said that, um, at each of these cyclic points, we should see a change in trend. And we are at point number two now. Today, it's we are living in today's world. So short term, short term conclusion is um, we, we are now primed cyclic wise for a correction in Bitcoin. However, that correction, if, if it will now kick in, should provide the next interesting buying opportunity in the summer season. So that's that's how you read it. No? So um, we, we might see a short term top here. We need to switch to more technical analysis to fine tune now or to get to a trigger point here. This is just the perspective. This is not a, a trade trigger here, but uh, I'm sure Jake will continue on that in, in the next sessions here. Um, but that's the forecast. Um, look out for a short term reversal in that behavior here uh, in the sense staying in the longer term trend I would not go short here because we are in the summer season so maybe you can just load up when you identify the next interim low maybe somewhere in yeah, where's the timing projected here so we talk about April Maybe April this year could be from a timing wise, if technical situation lines up. So if we now see one or two months, maybe of correction until March, early April, that would be the next interesting point to kick in the next cycle to the count of three. Um, and then just make our position management, trade management, risk management, uh, follow through uh, management. Uh, but that's about how to manage a trade. This is more giving the perspective about what cycles tell us. So that's it mainly. That's where we are in Bitcoin related to the key cycle. Maybe I just can switch to the to the cycle scanner to give you also a live feeling um, on that. So I just need to switch screen here and just five minutes and then we can open the session for questions. Um, just sharing the right screen here so i've now switched to our uh, cycle analyzer tool set which is available to every member of the foundation so if you uh, will join as a member you will have access to that tool set here and you can do exactly the same what i'm sharing here with you so we open our tool set to everyone um, this is the current data of bitcoin just for the last 800 bars. And I'm just a little bit smiling on that because Larry made a very important point. Often too much data will not help you to get better projections. And that's why the, the basic starting point for every cycle analysis, just start with the current past. Don't load every data you have in your analyzer because maybe, and not talking about 1929, but exactly these effects. If you average up too much of historical data, you might be good in detecting cycles in the past, but curve fitting to the past has never worked out to be profitable on the right side of the chart. And this also applies to cycle analysis. Um, but looking at that outcome now, in the lower left, you see the spectrum. So this is how the dynamic cycles for the last two years look today. Yeah, just the last two years, dynamic cycle analysis, where we are, and each of these peaks in the spectrum here is shown in the table view on the right side. So if you are new to cycle analysis, this is the basic view on cycles. We use price data. You can load up sentiment data. You can load up CPI figures, whatever. The cycle scanner doesn't care about what kind of data you analyze. The spectrum is the view about the amplitudes, the cycles which are active, and you can then see these amplitudes are also related to any given cycle length. Um, then you we look out for the most dominant cycles in that spectrum. And 
And that's also what you only are aware of if you have this long-term analysis of which cycles to watch out for if they are there or if they are not there. So just on a short-term basis, maybe it's not obvious, but we see that these nominal 200-day cycle is currently active at a length of 192. And I will explain why I use the 200 here. So it's there. It's not just the most prominent one if we just use the short amount of data um, for that one. So you see the 192 days um, is there, so we see the nominal cycle. The uh, Bartel score is okay, not the best one, but uh, above 50 for that short period of time, not the whole data set. Uh, the strength score in regards to impact on price movement is a little bit lower, but we know that this cycle has an important timing information, so maybe the strength is not as important, and it's here. Um, so that's at least the cycle I'm the first one interested in. Uh, it's, it's the same here, so we see we have passed a little bit the topping period. For sure, if you just have this short-term view, you must pay attention to this other peak which is standing out in the spectrum with 152 cycles but maybe that's why I referred to the analysis maybe you would have overlooked the 200 day cycle if you have no clue about the historical behavior and that asset class and which cycles have been active so it's always important to have a, a clue about which cycle is persistent which has been there always um, what I recommend in these cases, here, let's deactivate the 192 day cycle and just activate this 152 cycle, which seems to be more important in this short amount of past two years, um, but it will not alter the outlook. And, and that's another important topic here. Um, you should never use cycles and make a projection for the next uh, six swings. So we have, uh, there will be a top, there will be then uh, a low, and there will be the next top, and then treat this as a static projection for the next, I don't know, two years to come. Just, I mean, you could plot forward a cycle. Once you have a cycle, you could plot it indefinitely, indefinitely into the future, but you should never do that. We are always only interested in the next turning points of that cycle. And here you see now, that's the, the coincidence. If they show you the same projection, so the 150 day cycle is currently topping, um, moving a low then into March. And if I deactivate the 150 and switch to the nominal 200 day cycle, you see the outcome, the phasing, the timing conclusion is the same. So yes, maybe on 150, if just looking at the current two years is more important, I know that the 200 day cycle is for me more interesting to watch out. Anyhow, they give me the same outlook, the same perspective, which even gives me more confidence in maybe following that kind of cycle. Yeah, so we are here. Um, last and maybe final comment, as I always said, the cycles are not a trigger to act in the you trade price you don't trade time yeah we have not find an, an way to trade time um so we always need to trade the price out there so be careful not just only relying on timing information but we can use this timing information this 150 and the 200 now to fine-tune technical indicators just in short if you've not heard about that and some technical indicators are included here um, which we can activate. I will not go, not go in depth here, but these technical indicators, which is also nothing really secret here, but if you know how to use the input parameters of technical indicators based on the cycles, they will become much more reliable. And this is what we need to do then using the 190 day cycle as an input for a technical indicator here in RSI, we see it triggered also a possible short-term sell indication here. So technical situation, timing situation of the current 200 day cycle seems to be a good spot for a correction. But remember, we are in the summer season, so the long-term uptrend or the long-term parabolic upmove could just have started. Um, so always be careful uh, putting that into perspective of the longer-term picture. Yeah, and 
um, if you if you use more data, that's what I said in the chart before. I said the 200-day cycle is still dominant here. So if we use 10 years of daily data, where you need to be careful, adding more and more data to your analysis does not automatically translate into better prediction. So you need to know what you're doing. But as we know from an historical perspective, what to look for, uh, just completing the analysis with latest data, you see here that the 200 day cycle is the most prominent one using today's data. So it's even shown at rank number one. So we have integrated the automatic ranking to make it more easy for you which cycle to use. It is ranked by our guidance system as the most dominant cycle. Um, it's on top of the chart. It's seen here as a key peak in the spectrum. Uh, it has, compared to the other cycles, the highest strength, good bar tail score. So that's the 200 day cycle. If you use more than just the last two to three years, which is the short term phasing approach, um, even if we use more data, the 200 day cycle is on top of that list. Um, and we see the same phase situation here. So this is a down lag. This is the two. So here's the one, here's the two. So it will now move. And then we have the three, the four, uh, and the count of five somewhere in summer 2025. But anyhow, as I said, we don't rely on that. We are just aware of that the summer season just kicked in. Here's the 200 day cycle. We could activate here also our um, cyclic technical information now, which is hovering around the upper band. So this would also confirm a possible correction um, for that point in time. So maybe indicating, I would look out now, if you're interested in that asset class, um, don't get that FOMO <laughs> now, wait maybe until March for another possible good entry point for that asset class to play the summer games. <laughs> maybe to end the, the the talk uh, with that sentence. Um, yeah, I hope um, you got a clue out of that. Um, and I tried to share you some, uh, also a journey on cycle analysis with that approach. So it's not only doing a prediction here. Um, this is sharing a journey about um, what you can uncover when you are willing to invest time spending in this analysis. And as said, uh, it proved, it guided me not here to selling forecasts, this is for free. Um, but if you can use this perspective for your own trade decision making, um, it pays out if you invest the time. But I will start now to repeat myself. Gone. <laughs> That's it for today. Thank you very much, Lara. Some uh, great work, uh, always insightful in terms of the groundbreaking kind of uh, uh research you're doing behind the scenes and then releasing it uh for everyone to learn um and then also build uh for themselves and in, in terms of their own research one of the questions that come to mind of course and I'm, I'm trying to categorize it in a coherent way is always going to be that market call question in terms of what does all of this analysis suggest for bitcoin here and now i know you you, you were teasing that out in, in in the in the in the presentation in terms of past cycles and current um but in a nutshell how would you describe the likely bitcoin uh, performance for this year Let, let's see a correction or let's let's await a correction for the next one to two months um and then another big upswing into summer this year um, and then we need to revisit the cycles that what i said i, I would never project anything beyond the next uh, two turns on that cyclic protection and then an extension of the same market call question from Sergei is asking how deep the correction could be on that number two wave. Uh, I don't expect a deep correction now um, because we are in, in this summer season, which is more expecting the count one, two, three, four, five will move will move us in the next parabolic up move. So I would just expect a small correction now, not a big correction. The big correction will happen in 2025 not this year so this year is more to expect that the long-term picture for this year is it will have a bright um upswing perspective in bitcoin uh, which could which could conclude 
into the um, parabolic situation early 2025. But then it's too late. Yeah, if, if you're seeing this parabolic behavior early 2025, then you should not jump on it. So maybe 2024 will anyhow be a positive year for that. And if it plays out, then you can play the next parabolic up move maybe happening in this final move early 2025 and you're positioned for that before the fact, <laughs> not, not after the fact. That's that's what I would expect now for that. So it's not a short term trade. I'm I'm I'm. I'm proposing nothing here but it's not a short-term opportunity uh it's more the long-term season which i think is more important for this year which is positive and, and that potentially ties in with the halving cycle ahead yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly so um I, I tried not to relate anything to other similar to larry i, I don't know what is the root cause <laughs> maybe it's the halving cycle but that's the question nobody will be able to really answer what's the root cause there there is some root cause behind the cycle is just showing that there is something there there is some, we, we don't know the root cause we just see the outcome here but uh you're right it could be so there are these discussions about the the halving cycle yeah Interesting. And then some technical questions on, on the timing itself. So the 200 uh, period cycle, I'm careful not to, to put a, a calendar on it, because that's the actual question. Uh, calendar days or trading oh. days, how do you how do you define it? Yeah, in, in that case here, we are using uh, calendar days. So okay. it's the the, two, the nominal 200 day cycle is related to calendar days. So therefore, thanks for that question. Yeah, that's important. Okay, and then a question from Richard, which which is uh, an interesting one in terms of a cross asset application. Have you found a similar pattern on other markets? N not in that sense. Not not this pattern. But um, it, it. I'm alluding to the five three count or, or a variation of that. Yeah, um, not yet, but I'm more and more looking into that because, to be honest, it was the first time while doing these asset class analysis that I found this specific count of several repetitions of a cycle, which conclude to even more important uh, turning points. So it's quite new for me, um, but I'm extending that research now for other asset classes. And, and can I clarify from my side, Lars, I recall in the, in the last presentation uh, that you hosted, it was this three cycle rule that, that essentially is, is the reliability factor for the cycle. It tells you that the cycle exists, it's, it's, it's viable and, and can be projected. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's, um, that, that's, I think you, you need to have at a minimum of three possible repetitions of a cycle in that data set before I would anyhow trust it. So that's, for example, the length of 850, which, which I've shown here, is exactly related to that rule of three repetitions of a cycle. Because as a standard, we, we measure cycles up to around 300 to 400 days. And if you want to reliably measure that cycle, you, you need to be able to have three repetitions of a let's say cycle with 300 days so you need to have 900 data points or 850 on, on average to to reliable have a repetitions of three times of a cycle with a length of around 300 days so that's the starting point where i say you, you need to have um, data where three repetitions can be measured and then the bartels score gives us a statistical information about how statistically reliable is this repetition compared to a theoretical cycle of three repetitions? So, and then 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 it's 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 combining two methods. So the cycle analysis per Z, which gives us ah there is a cycle, but it does not tell us how many repetitions have been perfect or not. So the cycle analysis or the dynamic cycle analysis just shows us here is a cycle, and then. If we have a high Bartel score, this shows us, ah, we have a high correlation between the amount of repetitions and the data set. So the higher the Bartels, so if we have a 100% or perfect Bartel score for that, which means that we have three perfect repetitions in that 850 days period. Um, and then you can start to trust that identified cycle. And, and so, to build on, on that same logic, but looking forward, you made a very interesting point about taking care 
um, for those forward projections, three to six cycles ahead, or, or I think that was the general range. What can you, what insights can you share on that for, for people who may be using this for the first time and wanting to predict it all in one go? <laughs> yeah, Zach, here's my cycle analysis for the next 10 years, so <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I can stop my subscription now. Uh, yeah, um, that's the hard way to learn. Um, as And we have seen that for this 200 day cycle, sometimes it's 190 days, sometimes it's 210 days. Tomorrow it might be 201 days. So um, it will alter anyhow moving forward. So therefore we need to remeasure and, and we should not even not wait maybe until the next low comes in. So we, I do this every day. So we need to remeasure tomorrow. Maybe it alters to 201 days. So that's, and that's exactly the fact. You should not look too much into the future because of the error of this deviation. So you, you make today a static prediction of three repetitions of a 200 day cycle in the future. If it just alters to 202, uh, um, then for the for the next top or low, you just have a very small error rate of two days. But this error then multiplies by three. If you go three repetition into the future, the error rate the error rate of that projection really becomes larger and larger. So that's that's more mathematics about if if the error rate of that projection gets too high, yeah, you should not use it. And and that's exactly the effect. So if you have varying cycles. The more you move into the future, the higher the error rate of that projection is anyhow. So, Very insightful uh, uh, point to end on. Um, and, and also an, uh, a potential disclaimer for, for all of us using cycles in different ways that uh, the, the reliability factor can uh, become more unstable uh, yeah. in yeah. the future. So reevaluating, reassessing is, is key. Exactly. And therefore, the mixture of having nominal cycle models, I mean, other introduced this before, like the Hearst nominal cycle model, I think everyone will be aware of that. So the, the concept is not new. And then measuring the, the real cyclic situation today, that's that's the same concept here, just just with um, yeah other tools we have now at our finger hands. Thank you very much, Lars. On. Thanks for having me here. Always a pleasure, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to day two uh, to, to follow up. And uh, on that, uh, I will just uh, thank everyone for uh, attending our FSC market forecast uh, annual event day one. Uh, replays will be on YouTube. Uh, remember to become a, a, a Cycles Insider, join the uh, FSC. Uh, particularly before Feb 1st, uh, when the membership increase takes place uh, from 150 to 199. The link is in the chat, should still be there um, if you want to click and follow through. Uh, remember, uh, FSC is a nonprofit. Our work is made pos uh, possible by membership dues and donations, uh, which are always appreciated. Uh, last reminder, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, our Follow-up speakers will be Jake Bernstein and Robert Prechter. Thanks all. Uh, on behalf of the Foundation Study of Cycles, uh, Ron William, your host and moderator, FSC Development Director. Thank you very much. All the best.